Hello. Yes. It's me, Ghost Critic, back for another week. And this is the end. Yes. It's the end. The end of three DC books this week. Um, with the 52 fa new 52 fast approaching, all the titles are coming to an end. And three on my pull list did just that this week. So, of course, I've got a few things to say about those. But let us crack on with uh, what else was on my list. Um, good and very bad this week. Let's start with the highlight. Always a highlight. It's Morning Glories and it's issue 11. And we have the backstory of Ike, our favourite um, millionaire socialite bad boy, we'll say. Um, the interesting thing about this title currently is we are up to issue 11 and I have no idea really what's going on, but in a good way. I mean, for the last four or five issues, this is all we've had. We've had the backstory of all our main characters, um, why they are there now, what has led them to be there, and all their kind of deep, dark secrets. But actual plot and what is going on in this school is very rarely touched upon. But damn it, I don't care. Um, and this surprises even me. Um, Nick Spencer just writes a, such a great story that whatever's put in front of you, you just you just lap up. Um, some more momentum with the actual story would be appreciated, and you know we might get some more in the next. Um, the next arc of uh, Morning Glories, but I'm certainly on board for it. It's an excellent read. The artwork um, by Isima and Esquejo, if that's how you pronounce it, is, is just lovely to look at. Um, definitely pick it up. Um, I believe the second trade is either out or it's about to come out, so pick up the first two and then start reading it in singles issues because you can't. You can't not read this in single issues. It's such a good, good read. Pick it up. So from the great to the absolutely hideously bad and it has been dropped. <clears throat> X-Men. This is issue 15.1 and this was a stinker of an issue. I'm sorry but it was terrible. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I always thought these point one issues were for kind of like new readers to, to kind of jump on board, um, a nice place to start off, not too continuity heavy, but enough to keep both, you know, loyal readers and new readers both happy. This is just trash. It's terrible. It's an unoriginal story. We have some kind of Indian colony um, and way back the, the shaman was trying to um, ward off all these demons and his girlfriend, wife, lover um, to save the village uh, sucked in all these demons into her body and put herself into like a self-induced coma so they couldn't come out. But obviously the years gone by, she's getting older older and she's going to die. Um, so for some reason the X-Men are called, how that happened, to try and stop this from happening. Well obviously it all goes tits up and we get a, a guest appearance from Ghost Rider and it's just pointless. I, uh, this title for me has been slipping um, for, for quite a while now and this was just the last nail in the coffin. This is getting dropped and I'm adding the Punisher from last week onto my pull list. Terrible, don't pick it up. I can't see it getting any better. Another great read, thank God. 
The Unwritten, issue 28. And just first, look at that cover. I love that cover. It's made out to be kind of like a, like a, a retro 30s, 40s look. And um, it's just, it's just beautiful. The Unwritten, it's great because it's gone away from what could have potentially been a kind of Harry Potter-esque, but for adults, pro you know, properly for adults, um, storyline, to something so much more deeper, so much more interesting. And you do, you have to really read this comic. And, I mean, it's a strange thing to say, because obviously we read the comics, but this, you know, Kerry put so much thought and so many spanning ideas um, that really make you think. And I mean, I've read this a few times now. It's not something I often do. I might, if a comic's really, really good, I'll read it again. But when I'm reading it two or three times, you know that, you know, I'm, I'm really enjoying this and I want to make sure I understand that I'm not the most intelligent person. I've, I'm not the most eloquent of speakers. Um, but I know there are some really kind of, for want of a better phrase, kind of really deep thoughts going on here about, you know, the kind of art and culture of the story and how it affects our lives or does our lives affect the story. Um, I just love it. There, there is really some nice, you know, little kind of twists going on here. The artwork is, again, it's just lovely by, um, by Gross. And I'm just loving this. It's definitely worth picking up. I mean, it's only on issue 28, so you could easily pick up, like, the last... Th I think there's three trades out now, and then start reading it properly from, from like, the single issues, just to catch up and realise how underrated this title really is. Um, oh, was it Pick of the Week? Yeah, I'm going to give it Pick of the Week! Amazing Spider-Man issue 667 and yes we're properly into Spider Island now. Again a fantastic cover there from um, Delgado. Is it Delgado? I think it is isn't it? Yeah from Delgado and Ramos did a cover between them. Um, I'm not usually big on the kind of oh let's throw a team on the front cover and put them in kind of an action shot. Um, it's, it's often a bit lazy but I like this cover because, you know, you've got all the um, all our heroes in there, but they've all got their own style of um, Spider-Man costume, which, you know, if you've read this comic, I'm not, I won't spoil anything for you, but, you know, a lot of people have got a lot of Spider-Man costumes on in here. Again, it's just a fun, well-action-paced story from Dan Slott. He throws in lots of lovely, like, stuff from um for, for like long time readers to just go yeah what that was clever what you just did there um and there's lots of intrigue in there you know you've got the bit with um oh madam webb in there and more with uh the jackal and of course the big superhero team coming in with with um, the likes of Spider Woman, you've got Cloak and Dagger, you've got Ms. Marvel, you've got Hawkeye, you've got Spider Girl in there. And it's just, it's just such a fun, exciting, dynamic read. And you know, I, just from this title, I mean, I was on board with the prelude. This has just cemented my love for Amazing Spider Man at the moment. You cannot go wrong picking this up. You don't have to have been a long term reader of Amazing Spider Man on this. All you need to know is everybody on um, Long Island is getting s is spider powers. What more do you need to know? It's brilliant. And so we come to three DC titles, all with varying quality, but all the last issues before the DC reboot. Birds of Prey, issue 15. And I have to say, when I started reading the first few pages, it occurred to me I hadn't a clue what had just happened in the last issue. And I didn't care. And that is so 
such a bad thing to say for this title. And it's a shame because Gail Simone had written such a great run on this. Okay, it was short, but to throw this in at the end, it's just insulting. It really is. It deserved so much better. It was a throwaway title, which they'd probably been keeping on the back burner just in case Gail Simone couldn't write for a couple of issues and they could have filled this in the story, which it appears what they're doing. I'm so saddened that Gail Simone couldn't finish this title off. Um, fine, she's got lots of titles to deal with in the New 52. She managed to finish off Secret Six and that everyone has been, you know, praising that title. And that's kind of just what I hoped for Birds of Prey at the end of this, that, you know, I would have that Secret Six Gail Simone moment where I could go, this was a fitting ending for the Birds of Prey. But instead it was throwaway, it was fast food, it was McDonald's, it was Kentucky Fried Chicken. Disappointed. Red Robin, number 26, and slightly better. Um, this was the kind of event that we've been kind of waiting for for a long time. Um, Tim Drake and um, Boomerang, Captain Boomerang, and their kind of face-off for one, as I guess. Um, obviously, for those who don't know, uh, and for those who do, just a reminder, you know, Captain Boomerang killed Tim Drake's dad, so you've got the whole kind of revenge, wanting justice for this. Um, the great thing about this title was it shows Tim Drake the excellent tactician he really is. He he's thought about every possible choice that you know Captain Boomerang could make while this title is going on. He is very very much like Batman in the sense that he's thinking three, four, five steps ahead, and. The end, I, again, I won't spoil it for you, it's very early on in the week, you may not have read this. But, you know, there was moments that, you know, Tim Drake could go further than Batman would ever. Does he, doesn't he, read it? The thing that disappointed me much about this title is, and it's especially like last issue and this issue as well, there are hints of what, you know, this title could have been. The the path that Red Robin really was heading down. Um, but we're never going to see, and I'm so disappointed about that. I love this title. It's probably the one I'm going to miss the most. Um, but hey, that's, that's the 52 reboot for you. And finally, Batman and Robin number 26. This was actually quite good. Um, <clears throat> whether it was a fitting end for the title, I don't know. Um, it's just a kind of one-shot final story. Um, Batman and Robin, Dick and Damien, they go off to France and we, we are taken to basically France's version of Arkham Asylum and this one's called The Black Garden. Um, and it's just the most surreal, abstract kind of story um, you could have. Uh, the thing about Batman and Robin is through all its run, um, it has created, all the creators who've worked on this, have created some great new villains. Um, and I guess we're not going to see them now again, which is a shame. Um, again, this, this title brings in someone new, but not particularly original, which the villain himself says. Um, but, you know, it was it was a fun, again, a fun, kind of abstract, surreal read. Um, I was worried about the artwork because half of it is done by Ticini and the second half is done by Bresson. Um, but their, their artwork is, you know, pretty similar. So it wasn't so jarring halfway through going from one to another. Um, but that's it. The end of Batman and Robin 2. It's not long now, is it? It's about, what, two more weeks? And then we, we kick off with the new 52. Anyway, that's me, my comics for the week. 
a little bit teary to see a few titles go. But hey, change is good. Change is good. Change is good. See you next week.